What I thought I'd do today is read to you a few selections, or just short little snippets from the book to give you a taste of the book. Um, it's the best way to describe it is probably a dark comedy. It's a character who's likable to some. I think some people detest him, but hopefully his his journey is somewhat enjoyable, whether you like him or you don't like him. He's definitely a deeply flawed character. And he's delusional in a lot of ways, but he's also very big-hearted. Um, the situation you find Zeke in at the beginning of the book is he runs a nonprofit called the Great Midwestern Humanities Initiative, one of these things funded with, by corporations and the federal government with a very nebulous mission statement. And it's sort of going into the ditch, um, partly because of Zeke's own ignorance about how to run anything, and also because of the economy. I began to write the book uh, in 2007, and in 2008, when the market crashed and the recession hit, I was a, working as a full-time novelist, and that was a terrible time to be a freelancer. <laughs> um, so the book became went from sort of a dark political allegory to a much more anxious, panicked, angry little book <laughs> about uh, um, a young man trying to find his place in the world, in a changing world, in a world where the things we used to count on to be sustainable and, and funded and prosperous we no longer were something you could count on. It was, I, 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 late, I, I grew up, or I was in college here in Ann Arbor about five blocks away. I lived on East Jefferson Street, and we used to have these epic parties as people do in college. And in fall 2008, after the, the, the economy collapsed and the recession started to become something that was uh, very real to me personally and to a lot of my friends at the time, um, I had the feeling that I was back in college at one of those house parties the morning after. And you're waking up and you're looking around and you're thinking, wow, we really got out of hand last night. And then you start to find the broken stuff, and you start to blame your friends. You start to, one, one group points at that, that you broke that table, and that is, you broke that window. And there's a lot of blame going around. And I felt like the economy was kind of in that situation after the recession. There's a lot of people walking around trying to figure out who did this, what, what sides policies broke it. And the, the sort of tragic comic thing of the, this recession that started in 2008 um, and I think also the, the unifying thing about it is that everybody was sort of at fault. There's no way you can look at the recession and say that one set of policies led to it and that one group was totally free of it and the other one wasn't. It, it was uh, a lot of sort of delusional thinking on the part of a lot of sectors of the economy and a lot of individuals and a lot of big entities. Um, so this book is sort of a book about the end of delusions. When you, when you have you, you're on an unsustainable trajectory, but then your life falls apart. And, and it's about a crack-up, a personal crack-up of a man named Zeke Pappas, and also the crack-up of the nation that I think happened around then. Um, it's ultimately a hopeful book. I don't want to give away the ending, but in case you're looking for a summer read, I do think that the final scene is a happy one, happy-ish. And I do think that the turn of the book gets a bit slapstick, a bit farcical, and ultimately, hopefully, um, somewhat somewhat profound or at least meaningful to you. Um, so I'm going to read you just a few sections from the book and then take questions about writing or about the book or anything else you want to talk about. Um, and I'm going to start uh, early in the book. Zeke discovers that he has, he doesn't have a lot of social skills. He doesn't have a lot of skills and empathy with uh, human beings. He sort of loves people but has a hard time keeping real relationships. So most of his friends in the book are people who work at the local coffee shop or his, his assistant at work. He doesn't have a lot of deep, meaningful friendships. The guys at the bookstore, people who kind of have to talk to him, and Zeke mistakes those often for, for deep personal relationships. But he discovers this special talent he does have, this emotional clairvoyance, of guessing the Starbucks order of anybody in line uh, before they order it. And he's fallen in love with this woman named Min, who, is, uh, with, who works at the Starbucks around the corner for his, from his office. So I'm going to read you, uh, early in the book, um, he is headed back to his office after giving a sort of disastrous, semi-drunken talk to the Rotary Club of Madison, where he was trying to raise money. Instead, he just sort of makes a jerk of himself and, and, and slinks out as the Rotary Club moves him off the stage. And um, so he decides to go to Starbucks to both sober up to see this woman he has a crush on men and to play this game he calls the Starbucks Challenge. 
Before I head back to my office, I decide to stop by Starbucks on the Capitol Square. Not so much because I want a cup of coffee. In fact, I worry that any caffeine might prematurely end the minor buzz of a midday cocktail. But because I want to see Min, full name Minerva Colt, who is 29 years old and the assistant manager of the Starbucks. Min is one of those service industry professionals with a competence and friendliness that are rare. I enjoy my mid-afternoon caffeine jolt so much, partly because she is the one who serves it to me. We're not really friends, Min and I. Not yet. In fact, we've never had a conversation in which we are not separated by the merchandise cluttered counter of the Starbucks, exchanging quips and pleasantries over a folk rock compilation and a small stand of roasted almonds and chocolate-covered espresso beans. I have friends beset by liberal guilt who refuse to set foot inside the Starbucks, despite my assurances that the store has decent and rapidly approving business practices and geopolitical stances. I also happen to prefer their coffee's hearty richness and their homogenized and nationalized standards of quality control. So be it. But I go there ultimately because of Min, with her dark hair and her blue eyes, and the smile that twitches when she shows her teeth, the freckles barely visible on her high olive cheeks. When she serves me my usual drink, a tall triple shot roomy Americano, she never charges me for the third shot, which is technically an extra shot and should cost 85 cents. I'm just saying. Hi, Zeke, she says. Hello, I say. I glance at her left ring finger. Her diamond engagement ring is still there. It's one small thing I take note of each day. I don't know her fiance's name. I don't know who he is or what he does. I know nothing of Min's life outside the walls of this warmly lit national chain, and this is fine. Such relationships, based on the ancient economic, economic principle of supply and demand, are one of the most sacred elements of our social contract in America. Do you have time to play the Starbucks challenge, she asks. Brightly, she smiles. I do, I say, and smile back. The Starbucks challenge is a game I invented one day, publicly sharing a gift that I long held private. I was feeling particularly bold and confident, perhaps somewhat inspired by the way Min had her dark hair, shorter than usual, held out of her eyes with a small pink barrette. A new customer walks into the coffee shop, and Min and I share a quick, knowing glance. Her smile is the sort of smile that seems secretive, and her posture can only be described as sheepish, as if she is always hanging on to an inside joke. In this case, she is. You can take care of this gentleman first, I say, stepping aside and motioning to the man who has just come into the store. He is doughy, tall, with a buzz cut. He wears pleated khakis and a red golf shirt with a country club insignia on the left breast. I glance at him, former college athlete now making a go of it in sales. Far from home, a long drive ahead of him, he wants a special treat, an acceptable vice until he goes home to his wife and children. He's marginally in love with his wife. She sort of detests him. His kids he adores. Only on the golf course does he feel truly comfortable. If I turned to him and asked, why are you so unhappy, he would tell me all of these things. Instead, I wave him ahead of me in line. Thanks, he says. I stop him. I have this game I like to play. Might I guess what you're going to order? Huh? I like to guess what people are going to order just by looking at their faces. He's quite good, Min says. I'm always amazed. The man gives Min a flirty smile. It occurs to me that Min could come work for me someday and add energy and dazzle to my day. Yeah, okay, go ahead, the man says, then gives Min a wink as if to say, hey, dollface, who's this clown? Should we humor him? I turn my back while Min hands the man a post-it notepad and has him write down his order. Okay, Min says. Caramel frap, extra whip, and a toffee bar, I say, still facing away from the counter. The man looks around the shop as if he expects to be flanked by cameras. Holy shit, the man says. <laughs> That's amazing. How did you do that? I turn to him. I'm remarkably intuitive about other people's emotional landscapes, especially strangers. I'm much better with strangers. The less I know you, the better. See, Starbucks is a source of simple pleasure, an acceptable and fulfilling vice, if you will. I like to look at people, measure the hardness of their day, their circumstances, the general crumminess they feel in their hearts, and decide what sort of beverage and perhaps snack could remedy their misery for a while. 
It's my belief that you are only happy on the golf course, but for now, this infusion of fat and sugar, and there is a great deal of it in the combination that you ordered, is akin <laughs> to temporary salvation for you. A crowd is formed behind the man. Min takes his money and hands him a small brown bag that holds his toffee bar, and her fellow baristas finish making his drink. The man walks away from me, bewildered and hollow. He is too disarmed, and I am too right for him to be angry. Do mind, says the next customer in line. She has overheard the entire exchange. She is in a black business suit, mildly attractive unless you focus on her face for too long, and then <laughs> you see the badly drawn lines of her mouth, a permanent frown as if she is in chronic pain. She's an uninteresting woman, I hate to say that, but she feels that in her bones, and she desperately wants to be interesting. Min hands her the notepad, and I turn my back. Vanilla skinny latte, I say, extra shot. She looks wildly enthusiastic. Do you do this a lot? Fairly often, I say. He's incredible, Min says. I love this guy. The woman in the black suit is really beaming now. Seriously, she asks Min. Seriously, I ask. And I'm thinking, does Min mean I love this guy, the way you talk about an odd and eccentric weirdo? Like, dude, I love that homeless guy who plays the kazoo all day on State Street. <laughs> or does she mean, you know, she loves this guy, me. It turns out the woman with the vanilla skinny latte extra shot is a reporter for Channel 3. And she wants to do a segment on me, maybe on men too, about how I guess drinks at Starbucks every afternoon. Well, I don't, I don't do this every afternoon, I say. Only when the cafe is slow. For example, we never play this game in the morning rush. And only when I'm feeling particularly intuitive. It's amazing, the reporter says. It always makes our day, says Tammy, another barista who is working the milk steamer. Min just smiles at me. She never seems not to be smiling. She may be the only genuinely happy person I know. Anyway, I tell the reporter, media attention would simply negate the subversive pleasure I get from this little game. People would come in to deliberately throw me off. Imitating guessers would prop up all over town playing cafes with guessing games. But anyway, you were debating getting a pack of trail mix. You should get it. But in truth, I think you really wanted a pumpkin stone. But there's your diet to consider, especially given your profession. Min is laughing so hard, tears come down her face. The TV reporter gives me her card as she exits. Her name is Katie Simon. The trail mix comment has left her dazed, as if I have plumbed an intimate region of her psyche. She's a bit more attractive now, smiling, and her gray eyes look almost blue, but no, they're gray. Her skin is pale, too, and in midwinter it will turn to gray. Soon her hair will be gray. It's possible that she'll be all gray soon, a gray woman. Do you have a gray cat? I ask her. As she <laughs> no, she just leaves, wide-eyed, near tears, and Min helps other customers, and I go to the washroom. When I come back, Min has my triple shot ready. On me, she says. Many thanks, I said. You have a dark edge to you today, Ben says, a sort of harsh subtext to your guessing. It's a gift, a useless one, but interesting. I've studied unhappiness for a long time, and now I can sort of guess everybody's unhappiness before they speak. And I also know, at least among a certain well-educated demographic, that Starbucks is a ritual, costly and mildly unhealthy as it is, meant to mitigate our day-to-day -day unhappiness. I like this, it's like this very focused sort of ESP, don't you think? Funny thing is, if I know the person at all, I can never guess what they'll order. I hear my name being called boisterously across the room. Seek! Stop that. <laughs> so that gives you a little introduction to, to Zeke's sort of lighter side. Um, on the darker side of Zeke is that he, uh, so facing him is he's been uh, through a lot of family tragedy, and his brother and wife, his brother and his brother's wife, have both died. One died uh, in Iraq, the brother and the wife died in a car accident shortly after. And that's left Zeke in charge with his mother uh, of two twin nieces who are seven years old. So Zeke has been sort of this confirmed bachelor. He sort of saw himself as a womanizing dandy, though that that's probably an overgenerous um, description of his love life. But he saw himself this way. And suddenly he is helping to raise these two twins, which he loves to do very much. Um, as the book progresses, we learn that the mother has been diagnosed with uh, stage four lung cancer and the, has to make a decision about custody. And she will only leave the girls to 
see if he gets married before she dies. Otherwise, they'll go to live with an aunt in Livonia, Michigan. Um, and uh, that's the, the tension that, that gets Zeke to stop thinking so much and try to act. And he quickly decides to make a list of his prospects, five women he would like to marry quickly, if he can, and set about to court them one by one. So uh, he does not, doesn't do that very well at all. In fact, uh, his sort of emotional crippledness has, comes out full tilt as the book progresses. At one point, he gets tased by one of the women <laughs> as he tries to get into the shower with her, thinking, misinterpreting her comment. Um, so there's a, there's a humor in the book. There's some darkness in the book. Uh, the character is, in a way, I think, indicative of um, where we've come as a country and that we, we're kind of coming to terms with some of the delusions we have, the delusions that you know, a little bit of debt doesn't matter. Uh, or uh, well, it, it's housing is an investment. How can a housing price go down? We'll, we'll buy the bigger house. Uh, these things we've all sort of done. Um, um, you know, well, why, why, why build hybrid cars? People love big trucks. They'll never want a fuel efficient car. These sort of things we did earlier, uh, 10 years ago, they're sort of coming back to haunt us now as a nation. I think Zeke sort of typifies um, the carelessness with which some, some decisions were made. I have another little section to read, but if, if we get to that, otherwise I'd like to also answer questions now or before we run out of time. So um, if there are some questions, I can answer them. I was just curious <coughs> if this is one of your influences or not, but uh, there are times when you were reading that really, that caught my attention that were a lot like uh, Mick Hornby. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he like sort of if, if he was like an influence of yours, like high fidelity. But <laughs> yeah, I read Mick Hornby a lot, uh, especially when I was younger. Yeah, uh, working in a bookstore. Yeah, it seems like the character. I mean, at least with his love life, it seems like sort of similar. <laughs> or, yeah, I mean, you know what I mean. Like a, yeah, it's the same influence. trajectory. It's sort of yeah. the, the yeah, like male it. version was called chiclet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> I actually learned uh, in the of course, writing this book, that, that this is actually called Kierkegaard's Narrative, which even though I'm an English major and now an English professor, I didn't know that. But it's this, uh, um, a lot of Zach Braff movies follow yeah. this trajectory yeah. stuff. It's this great trajectory of a, a young male who's aesthetically obsessed with something obscure, whether it be a record collecting, or in Zeke's case, this project called The Inventory of American Unhappiness he's working on. Um, they're obsessed with something aesthetically, and they think they can find sort of salvation or meaning and love, but they um, basically keep screwing it up. Yeah. Good observation. Yeah, definitely. Those I read those novels a lot. It seems like essentially that, like that, big sort of in my view, like sort of began with like <coughs> Catcher in the Rye. Although it's like not my favorite novel, but like sort of yeah. Mm -hmm. I was curious about something. Yeah, Catcher in the Rye is, is one of my favorites of all time. I still yes. reread that every year. <laughs> I, I mean, you, you sort of feel sometimes that, that you should come up with a, a different favorite novel, right. especially if you're 34, it shouldn't mean that much. Yeah. I I'm 35. Um, I think at 36, I'll hate it. <laughs> no, I, I reread Catcher in the Rye uh, in, while I was working on this novel. It was a marvel to have what a beautifully crafted book it is and how some of the sentiments are so true. Um, there were several books I read. Catcher in the Rye was one of them. And there was a line in there that stuck with me. I think I, I, I started reading it after Salinger died so mm -hmm. a few years ago. Um, but there's a line in there that says, uh, Holden Caulfield says, nobody, never tell anybody anything. If you do, you start missing everybody. And for some reason, all of a sudden, that was one of those things that, that hung over this book, that quote. Um, there's a book, Miss Lonely Hearts by Nathaniel West, which was written in a very similar time in American culture. It was written in a place the Great Depression was wearing on. And there was a lot of young artistic creative people trying to find work. And he wrote this book about a, a young writer who was writing an advice column under the name of Lonely Hearts. And that novel, actually, the epigraph for this novel comes from Miss Lonely Hearts. Um, and, and the epigraph is, is this. At college, and perhaps for a year afterwards, they had believed in literature had believed in beauty and in personal expression as an absolute end. When they lost this belief, they lost everything. Um, I think this book is about when you sort of realize, we start to come to terms with the reality of adulthood, which you guys all look really old, so you probably have done this <laughs> decades ago, but I'm just going through this. Uh, okay. <laughs> the, the reality of adulthood sets in. Um, and you start, you have to shift some gears and the things you thought would be so important to you for your whole life are not as important to you 
and the things that you didn't expect to be important to you um, are. And you need to really sort of make an What are some examples of that? Um, I, I think, well, let me, can I read, I'll read you a passage which, which I think okay. typifies <laughs> that, that transition people go through. Um, in Zeke is a good example. I mean, for me personally, one of the things I'm just going to live on the edge. You know, I'm going to be a novelist and I'm going to you know, not know where the next check's coming from, but I'll figure it out. And then you have children, and children don't numb your mind the way people like in sitcoms say they do. I mean, I think you still have a very full intellectual life. My wife and I have the same conversations we had before children as we did after. We just there's extra ones about diapers and stuff. But in general, there's this. You know, you stay the same person, but you do realize that uh, you're living, you're setting up a life for somebody else, and you're much more cognizant of that sort of thing. Whereas before, you're setting up your life, and now you're setting up a group of people's lives who are wholly dependent on you. Um, Zeke is Zeke notices this in the book, and um, mostly when Zeke talks, he's talking as a character, but there is little. There are little parts, which I'm sure some reviewers will find annoying and hate, that, that are little essayist rants on what he thinks is happening to his generation of people in their uh, late 20s and early 30s in America. So um, I'm going to read you a, a, chap a little passage, a couple pages, where he talks about why he's studying this. The thinking, the rationale, the philosophy behind my project is this. Americans are fundamentally unhappy, and they are fundamentally unhappy because they suffer from institutional addiction. If you consider the comfort for most, the wealth, relative, and opportunities, many, with which Americans have matured, it is mind-boggling to consider that anybody here could be unhappy. But everywhere I go, I see it. I can see it. Such unhappiness, such an overwhelming need to be drugged and distracted lest a moment of silent, melancholy self-reflection pierce our fragile hearts. Now, Zeke's a little more over the top, but <laughs> I don't, I should just do, do this claim, this isn't me, this is Zeke, but this is an essay-ish kind of rant. So. We are, at our heart, a nation of rugged individualists, not in the absurd capitalistic manner of an Ayn Rand protagonist or a blue-blooded intern at the American Enterprise Institute, but certainly in the manner of our philosophical forefathers, Emerson, Thoreau, Jefferson, Payne, these men all advocated a nation, a way of living, where men and women are free to march to the beat of their own drummer, empowered by self-reliance, by an abundance of practical skills, and by an economic and political system that champions pluck and innovation. How quickly has such an American ideal faded? Now we are all slaves to institutions, educated in them from the age of five or younger, and often imprisoned within them, accumulating piles of debt until we are pushing 30. At the end of our educational process, we know what? How to plant a garden, build a home, repair and maintain machines, hunt, fish, camp? Hardly. Rather, we leave these institutions with only one small skill. Trading commodities, analyzing prose, ceramics, wielding, wil welding widget A to widget B, and we immediately need to find another institution to take us in. General Motors, Yale, the Federal Reserve, the UAW, Target, any place that will allow us to put food on the table. Once food is on the table, we must find shelter, often for a growing family, and instead of having any idea of how to build a shelter, we must buy a shelter. And because the costs of shelter are so absurdly prohibitive in comparison with actual wages, we must move immediately into the debtor system, Thoreau-like into slavery. We must move into a home that is owned by an institution, Bank of America, Countrywide, City Financial, and we must make ourselves adhere to a payment schedule. We must then secure health care coverage from a large institution, finance transportation through a large in institution, deficit spend based on the leverage of a large institution, worship the Lord at an approved institution, and then one morning our children enter a federally mandated pre-K program or a $25,000 a year private preschool and the cycle begins again. You can almost hear the tiny hearts of America's children breaking as they gather around the story circle or line up for a carton of milk. Thus, for most Americans, life becomes a series of debts and dependencies on entities much larger and much more powerful than ourselves. The paradox is this. In the middle of such indebtedness and dependence, we are bombarded with an apparent array of choices. Are we not? Um, it's getting too downer, I'm good, but that's sort of... <laughs> Zeke feels that transition from 
young adulthood into sort of mid adult, mid middle age. By the time you get to middle age, you sort of know who you are. You sort of know, know who you want, but you are sort of indebted to certain things that you can't get out of a job that you have to keep. You have a mortgage, you have student loans. Um, and I think, you know, if I had a chance to go back and do it over again as a person, I would probably have maybe not taken out so many student loans. I probably would have made a, a few different decisions. Um, and I think that usually our maturity catches up with us when we know who we want to be, what kind of person we want, what kind of life we want. We're already plugged into things that we can't get out of necessarily. For, it's possible that that shifted, that I think that the two, one of the lessons, the, the benefits of the recession we're in has been a real uh, leveling of our expectations of what is sustainable, what should you take on, what sort of uh, problems and debts and obligations do you want to have as part of your life. And so. Um, Zeke becomes so overwhelmed by these ideas that he, that he, they kind of catch, catch him in a spiral where he feels there's no good life available to him unless he does something sort of rash. Um, and as the book progresses, he sort of gets a little more insane. Um, and and he, he talks less and gets caught up in situations more. There's a, there's a, a, a outfit in the book that's sort of harassing him called the Department of Departmental Oversight. It's a federal, <laughs> two federal bureaucrats have gone rogue and are going after him to try to shut him down. Um, and and that, that sort of adds a, a little bit of that slapstick is sort of as a, a, a chase that goes on and kind of shadow him throughout Madison. Any other questions? I know you mentioned that kind of this general time period inspired the book. Mm -hmm. Were there any individuals, like real individuals, <laughs> that inspired the character Zeke? Mm -hmm. Character Zeke, um, you know, the closest, it, I mean, the people who know me well in Madison know that there's a lot of autobiographical stuff in Zeke. I ran a nonprofit in Madison that was funded by federal money and corporate money and was the guy who managed to go out and raise the money for a pretty nebulous mission. I mean, it, it was a good organization, it did good work, but it was a lot of that talking of the last ten decade of like convincing people that just invest in this and it's going to pay great dividends culturally and intellectually. Um, so some of that, my job experiences are in there, but they're taken much more to like this Kafkaesque level. I was never as bad an administrator as he was. Um, uh, there is a, a congressman in here that is, um, Purely fictional, according to the lawyers at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. <laughs> no resemblance to any uh, anti-immigration senator from congressperson from Wisconsin. <laughs> so if you read it and you think it, you know it's, it's fictional, and the lawyers have said so. so. <laughs> I might get in trouble. <laughs> um, how much do you agree with Zeke? I know I came in late, mm -hmm. um, but I. I'm trying to think like, how else would my life be yeah. without an institution? I mean, I would think like where we were maybe a thousand years ago. Right. Right. <laughs> I, I mean, an institution is what it has to exist for an economy. Otherwise, I would have to grow my own plants and yeah. build my own house. And yeah, but I find I, it pretty difficult that way too. Yeah, I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think it is a better option. I think it's just part of the reason we sometimes, even though we're so prosperous, feel trapped that we feel there's nothing we can, it, it's too hard to make a change. Um, I don't think it's necessarily wrong, and, and uh, you know, in my personal life, I've always been like an institution. I, I was a freelance writer for a few periods of my life, which were early. And at the same time, one period of freelance writing, I was on a National Endowment for the Arts Grant, which is a government grant. So, I mean, I was not a lone wolf. And the other time, I was dependent on a huge publisher. So I don't think it's bad to be dependent at all on an institution, but I'm not sure there's an alternative, but I think Zeke and I feel that there's this um, weird paradox in America. We have so much ease and comfort, but sometimes we, you talk to your friends and you go out to the bar and you're over drinks like, I'm so depressed, I hate my job. And that's, people say that even though they have a great job. I had a great job when I was in Madison. I often would say, I hate my job, I hate going to work. Why is that? I think it's that sense that we don't know. There's no other way to pull off the grid. You feel like there's no way to get off the treadmill. Um, so it's a very nice problem to have. I mean, on a lot of levels in America, we have really nice problems. 
we have problems of, of not having the perfect job or you know, I'm well aware that in a lot of countries this book would get me killed because it's very critical of certain things about the government. Um, so we have these blessings in this country that are, are hard to ignore. But it doesn't mean you're still happy all the time. You don't always feel satisfied. Um, and it's good to look at that. Sometimes it's good to know maybe maybe I am trapped. Maybe I'm in an institution that, that's not good for me. Or um, you know, is there something else you can change? Yoga? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Does Zeke have, like, I feel like it's unfair to ask the question since I read the book, but does Zeke have, like, uh, something he advocates for, like, some sort of, because um, it seems like it's, his project is kind of catalog on happiness and not necessarily to solve it, and then, yes, yeah, but the name also makes me think he should be, like, some sort of prophet, Yeah, it's a weird name to choose, so. Yeah, well, I think he's got delusions that he's working on something that's going to have profound social importance, and I think there's a satirical edge in the book that often... That, that I run with, the liberal intellectual class, I suppose you could call them, the artists and writers and scholars, get so involved in the project that we think this is groundbreaking, this is great, and it deserves to be funded and sustained, and then when it's not, we get bitter and it hurt. And I think that, that Zeke has that delusion that he's working on, the equivalent of something like Studs Terkel's working, these kind of groundbreaking books that illuminate how Americans think and feel. But really, he's just chronic, it's really a self-involved project, and towards the end of the book, his faith in the project starts to wane, where he realizes he's not going to really change much with this project. Other questions? I'd like to hear more about your writing process, like what, I mean, you must have like so many ideas, how did you settle on one to stick with for however many pages, and I don't know, just hear more about that. Yeah, uh, there's, there's sort of two muses I have, one is, is whatever keeps me up at night, the things that that keep me worrying at night, that, that give me insomnia. In this case, there are a lot of economic and political things in my head. So those obsessions are with me almost all night, and then I usually get up and write. So my characters tend to take on some of those obsessions, but in different ways. Um, and then there's uh, you know the very real muse of earning a living and, and, and putting food on the table. So you, know, you have these sort of two things that one muse gives you the subject, the other muse gives you the drive to sit down. So I, I've been fortunate to make money on the novels, and so this book was very much written on a deadline. Like it's time to stick to an idea. One of the hard things about writing is the new idea is so exciting. And I have 10 started novels on my hard drive right now, like mm -hmm. literally 10, 30 page. This might be one, this might be one. Um, but they're like relationships, like that first 30 days is so great. And you're calling and texting and you can't get enough. You know, when you see them, you just you shimmer and, you, you know, like everything is so exquisite. And like four years in, you're like, oh my God, I hate his socks, you know, or there's something. You know, like, why does she talk to her mother like that on the phone? She sounds like she's eight. You know, this monologue, right? And that's what happens to a novel. Like the first 30 pages, you're like, I'm so in love with this novel. Oh my God, it's great. And then around 60 pages, you're like, this is great. This is really what I need. I'm, I think this might be the one. And around page 200, you know if it's going to last or not. Yeah. Um, and it's, there's no way around it but writing through it. Just like there's no way around finding your perfect mate other than going on some bad dates. Um, but what, the new idea is the most exciting when you're working on something new. To finish this novel, um, it was really for me. It's just it was time. I had to get a second novel. I had a contract. It was it was time, and I decided to to go funny and to go write a novel that amused me every morning. So the last half of the book I thought was really funny. <laughs> and I hope other people do too. Um, and uh, you know, Oprah magazine called it funny. So if they call it funny. It's got to be funny. You get that, you get that Oprah stamp, and you're like, oh, I can't do it. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it's it's the slog. It, it's it's not easy to finish a book, and I think that's why so many people don't. Uh, you need to sort of commit to it, just like you need to commit to marriage. It's, it's a lot easier to bail on marriage somewhere around year seven or eight than to keep going. And I think with a novel, it's the same. Yeah. How many books have you written up to the two hundred, three hundred page, but didn't publish? I had, well, I had two published books and two unpublished books, mm -hmm. and I had many, many hundred page starts. I write very fast. I can write 20 pages in a day, but they're terrible. And so this, <laughs> this book is about, I think it's 300 something, 270 pages or something, yeah, 271 pages. 
which is exactly what my first book was, 271 pages. <laughs> I think that I'm going to try to build a career on 271 um, But I probably wrote a thousand manuscript pages of Zeke or of people like Zeke. Or, and there was one time when the whole novel set in Florida. And Florida's name I don't even mention in this book. Um, so yeah, I mean, you write a lot of pages. And it's, it's a learning. It's just like doing push-ups. You know, you, you, you can't just like whip off 200 push-ups. You have to do it you do every day. You can't whip off a novel if you're not writing pages every day. Uh, when I teach this novel writing seminar I do on weekends, I tell people one page a day. It sounds so cheap, right? But it really, if you do one page a day, you will have your novel in a draft form, and then you can decide to write it. And I always tell people, don't start over until it's done. Because the, the fun part is starting over. Um, so something about a clean start, a new cup of coffee, blank document on your <laughs> laptop um, that, it, that is so exciting. But uh, there's something so daunting about a 200-page document that you're scrolling through. Yeah. Google should fix that. There needs to be a novel writing software then, that, that can make it easier to revise. Go, go do that. <laughs> I don't even know if any of you are on the tech side. Too, I have such a fashion, fascination with people who, who work in tech and, and things they come up with. Is there something that tells you when your story is complete? Um, for me, it's a final image. I start to, to see the characters doing or saying something, and I know I want to get to that. So with Zeke, I very much saw this final moment, which of course takes place at a Starbucks. Um, but I, I saw it unfold very, very visually. I'm like, okay, there's there's where we're going. And it's about 80 pages from the end. Anyway. I didn't know how I was going to get there. I was finishing the, this, this final draft in fall 2008, um, or as close to final draft at least. And I had written two endings, because the book very much is about American culture. So I wrote the Barack Obama ending, if Obama won the election, and I wrote a McCain Palin um, ending if they won the election, because I thought Zeke would react very differently. So the book ends in November of 2008, um, and it ends uh, in Chicago, and then in the Lillian of the Berry Pines. So he leaves Madison, so probably you should read it. <laughs> but this is great, because it looks like you Google's already bought it, so I don't have to sell the book. Tell you the end. No. <laughs> yeah. Why did you choose to change the setting to Madison, Wisconsin, and from Florida? Like, besides the fact that you, you know, we could the, there. the Florida book was a when it was a real political book. It was very very angry, and it, I didn't want the book to be angry and point blame at one sector or the other. And I thought um, by having a Madison based liberal. So that's like a quintessential good liberal. Having a liberal as a likable, kind of likable protagonist who rants about conservatives, we would also see the delusion on the liberal side. I wanted to find a way to balance the politics so that even though the character is talking about conservative politics with the disdain, he's also engaging some practices that are very laughable to liberals. I wanted to feel more satirical. So I needed to set in like the epicenter of to be the epicenter of Midwestern American liberalism, so that I was also understanding the nonsense on that side of the aisle, which is my own side of the aisle. So I had to be cognizant of the fact that I didn't want a hero. I didn't want like this, it, kind of the first draft was like this liberal hero gets attacked by the shady wing of the government that's run by conservatives. And it just, it was cliche. And it, and it, it wasn't good, it was an angry little book. Um, Zeke is much more flawed, and I think he, he, he looks at the flaws in he doesn't know the flaws in his thinking, but they're pretty obvious to the reader. And I, I think that both sides get poked fun at in a way that I sort of wanted to achieve a balance of that. You never want a political book to be an angry novel. Like I think political novels that are just angry don't work. They need to, they need to embrace the complexity of politics, that people believe what they believe usually for very good reasons. And, and they have to have a compassionate way of time we have left. Um, we technically have to read until one, okay. so it's it's up to you if you want to do another reading and then... Yeah, I'll do a very short passage to close this back. Um, let me read you. From, this is kind of the end of... 
actually what I'll do, oh, that's a little dark. <laughs> <laughs> and you've, you've heard a lot of heavy things already. Um, I'll, uh, I'll read the section where we hear some of the interviews that Zeke does. These are responses to Zeke's website. Um, where he asks the question, he only asks one question. The way Zeke interviews people is he comes up to them on the street and says, why are you so unhappy? And he's amazed that so many people have been chewing on something. Some people ignore him and some people sort of, uh, you know, there's a, there's a YouTube channel where I had actors do these interviews. So if, you, if you go to YouTube and look for Zeke Pappas channel, these, 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 these interviews are actually acted out. Um, and sometimes people yell at him and sometimes people tell him why they're so unhappy. He also has a website, and these are some things that were posted to his website answering the question, why are you so unhappy? Theodore M., 28, cable installer, Morris, Illinois. Ideas. Ideas make me unhappy. I get so many of them. I'm going to make a film about my great uncle. I'm going to build a writing shed near the garage. I'm going to send a letter every day for the next year. But I don't follow through on anything. And I know that about myself, so it drives me crazy that I keep having ideas. I keep having ideas, but what am I doing this week? I'm re-watching The Wire on DVD. <laughs> Starting over, season one. Natalie B., 37, writer, Ames, Iowa. There's a place over here on Lincoln Way, and it's called the Village Inn or something. A little family place, a step up from a diner, but not by much. And they have this big banner in the window, something they have whipped up at Kinko's or something, and it says, free slice of pie on Wednesdays. And I think the deal is if you order a dinner, you get a free slice of pie for dessert. I'm not sure if the pie is any good. I don't care if it is or not. My guess is canned filling, pre-made dough. But what makes me almost inexpressibly sad is that I think that probably works. I think a bunch of people actually go in for a free piece of pie. I don't like thinking about that. I don't really have the ability to take that sort of thing. Um, some of them are like dirty. <laughs> I can't read that one. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, okay, Wanda P, 37, sales associate, Cody, Wyoming. I guess when I see grown-ups dressed up for Halloween, it sort of makes me unhappy. <laughs> Unless they're really se real sexy sorts of costumes, like a slutty bee or a dirty cop or something. And I suppose it's okay if they're with their kids or at some drunken party or whatever. But I'm thinking about a secretary who dresses up as a witch, you know, standing there in the glare of the insurance office's fluorescent lights, or a used car salesman who's wearing devil horns, or a postal clerk dressed up as a cowboy or whatever. I can't abide that. I can't think about it. It's about as sad as a guy who wears short sleeved shirts and what he describes as wacky neckties. There are things adults must not do, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. It's a little close to home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I always dress up for Halloween. <laughs> I always had coworkers who yeah. couldn't do it. And I wish I had the sort of freedom to do it because I think it takes confidence, but I was always, I was always too insecure. Um, yeah, there's. Anyway, I think. Uh, let me read you one. What time is it that we're going to 1246. Okay. Do a real quick little little ending one here. This is where Zeke's mother has uh, made him take a copy of Simply You magazine, which is basically like real simple, which I used to write for, and take a quiz about how to find the perfect list, uh, the perfect mate. At this point, Zeke doesn't know anything about his mother's condition. He just knows she's been harassing him as to why he's not married yet, and he's 34. So his mother is reading him this article. Does it seem like you're ready for marriage, but you don't have any prospects on the horizon? Well, just like any good business executive knows the importance of cultivating contacts and nurturing networks, any woman who wants to find Mr. Right knows that she must do the same thing. Follow these simple steps, and you just might be head over heels or engaged by the end of the summer. We've all read articles like this. <laughs> They're written by guys like me who are broke. <laughs> The article suggests that possible life mates are all around us, and as my mother works on a crossword puzzle from the morning's paper, I study the magazine's plan of attack. The article suggests you make a list of four people that you might want to know better. Make a list of four people whom you know, but don't know well. Pick one person you see every day, like a classmate, coworker, or that cute lawyer in your spinning class. Sometimes simple proximity can gradually lead to romance. 
I write the name Min in this space. Pick one person you really admire, a sort of dream date. Why not aim high? Is there someone you have a lot in common with? Somebody you just have to get to know better? Set your sights on this potential, Mr. Wright, by taking in something you'll both love and love to talk about over a bottle of wine, a breathtaking hike at sunset, an indie film, a play, or an art gallery. Here, I write the name Sofia Coppola, the noted film director. <laughs> the article says to aim high, and I've been sending Miss Coppola an email message each week for the past 18 months for professional reasons. I certainly consider her an outside possibility. She appears later in the novel. <laughs> Next, the writer continues, pick one person you're curious about, somebody you sense you might have, a little, might have a little crush on you. Find ways to be near this person. Flirt like mad. There's a space where there to write someone's name, and that's why I write the name Elizabeth Vandeway. And that's the, the married mother of three next door. Finally, you need to think of the obvious. Who is somebody you should have dated a long time ago? Who is the coworker, classmate, or buddy who may be bearing secret romantic feelings for you? Here I write the name of Laura Callahan, my assistant. The article goes on to detail strategies for success derived from the world of big business and corporate strategy. Quote, find an excuse to have face-to-face -face meetings. Every smart businesswoman knows that face-to-face -face contact with clients yields higher results than phone calls or email. Let them know you're open to a relationship. Nobody falls into a great new job without sending in a resume. Your prospects need to know you're single and looking for love. Maybe let them know you go to the movies all alone all the time, or how quiet your apartment seems this winter. Don't sound desperate, just independent and available. <laughs> Set a reasonable goal, both short-term and long-term. Pick a date when you'll reassess your list of prospects. Maybe pick a date for your desired engagement, too. Again, the trick is to visualize success. If you feel like a wanted woman, men will sense it. And Zika writes down the number 35 in his, in his 35th birthday in the space there as a potential goal. Um, and his mother looks at it and she starts to go over the, the list and, and she doesn't know who any of these people are and, sh and she gets sort of um, upset by his lack of seriousness. But then when she gets to the name of his assistant, she gets excited and she says, Oh, Zeke, she says, I'm so happy for you. This looks so encouraging. We sit in silence for a moment, sipping our tea. I look around at my house, full of tasteful furniture, original paintings, and hundreds of fine hardcover books. A pile of the girls' shoes is in the small wicker basket by the door. The coffee table in the living room is covered in poly pocket action figures and accessories. In one corner of the dining room, two Melissa and Doug art easels hold a collection of brushes and poster paints. The small side table that holds a bottle of fine single malt scotch and my favorite crystal tumblers also holds two American Girl dolls. My life has turned out in a way I have never imagined, and I make a comment like this to my mother, and she nods. You know, Mom, I say, I know we've had a lot of differences over the years, but you know, when I look around the house and see the girl's stuff everywhere, when I'm safe in the knowledge that the twins are sleeping upstairs above us, clean, warm, well-fed, and healthy, I have to say, Mom, we're doing this. We're making this work. My mother smiles, and she reaches across the table and takes my hand. And then her smile turns to a grimace, and her eyes begin to drown. She puts her palms flat on the surface in front of her. Mom, I say. Mom. But she doesn't look up at me, and it's only then that I understand everything, what all of this talking has been about. My God, I say, how long do you have? Six months, she says, maybe less. Thank you, Anna. I know. <laughs> Did you have to get special legal permission to, to have Sophia Coppola in the book, or how does that work? Um, no, she's a public figure, and okay. they don't have any, like, it's fictional. So okay. it's, I don't know. What, does, <laughs> this person doesn't count as a fictional figure, or a public figure? Congress or? people do, unless, the, Sophia Coppola doesn't really do anything in the book okay. that, that would be considered slander, slander the okay. congressman. Does it either? He's because he's made up. So, <laughs> yeah. Good question. I don't know. <laughs> I never signed a legal disclaimer that they sent me, and the book came out anyway. So, ha <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting nervous. <laughs> Do you guys have a corporate lawyer in I can talk to? <laughs> um, any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you yeah, so much. And if, Thank you. Um, those of you that the first five that got books, if you wouldn't mind signing those. Mm -hmm. Certainly, and if you um, want to hear more 
I don't know why you would, but if you are, <laughs> are somehow moved by it, I am reading in Nicola's books in Ann Arbor uh, tomorrow night at 7. So if you want to bring your friends, I'll sign more books. But thanks very much for spending your lunch hour with me. Thank you. Thank you.